This video will be on the selective permeability of the membrane. But first, let's talk a little bit about diffusion. So diffusion is the movement of any type of molecule from a high concentration to a low concentration. Diffusion can occur through any type of uh, fluid substance, um, including air. So it can happen in air or in water or other liquid solutions. <clears throat> diffusion eventually should lead to an equal distribution of molecules in two different areas. So here at the top, we see that there are many of these red molecules. On the left side, there is a membrane, um, but there doesn't have to be a membrane. Um, and then the molecules end up moving towards the right. And eventually you see that there is an even distribution of molecules on the left and the right. We see that on the left side here as well as on the bottom. Both of these depictions do show a membrane, but membrane is not necessary for diffusion to occur. As I said previously, you could just have an open space here where some of the red molecules start out on the left and then they move towards the lower uh, density or concentration on the right. And so, as I also mentioned, this can happen through the air. So if there is um, the scent of fresh baked cookies in the air, then that scent is going to diffuse into the other room. And uh, again, diffusion leads to even distribution and mixing. So there's an equ equilibrium state but it does not mean that molecules stop moving. So in this image on the bottom left here, the red molecules are still crossing the membrane. They're moving back and forth between the left and the right sides. It's just that they're doing it at an equal rate. They're moving from left to right and right to left at the same rate so that we still end up with the same concentration on both sides. And the, uh, this depiction here shows that this doesn't just apply to one type of molecule. So in this image, we have two different types of molecules. We allow them to diffuse across the membrane, and we end up with an equal number of each type of molecule on each side. And this is going to be really important for the lecture that we have in a couple of days on action potential. So there's overall movement from high concentration of any type of molecule to low concentration of molecules. And then there's also the diffusion for a specific molecule. So if there was sodium on the left and chloride on the right, we get movement of chloride into the left and sodium onto the right. It's not just going to be the um, sodium moving to the right so that there are equal number of molecules or atoms on both sides. Now, in addition to diffusion, we also have osmosis. And osmosis is a description of molecules moving across a membrane specifically. So again, in diffusion, we don't need a membrane. Osmosis is a specific type of diffusion that involves a membrane. And here we have a depiction of osmosis, which I'll just let go. And it is the movement of water across a membrane. <clears throat> and here there is a membrane in between the left and the right side of the beaker. And instead of having the sugar molecule move so that we have a more equal concentration between the left and the right, we actually see the water move because the sugar molecule cannot cross the membrane. So it's almost like thinking about the concentration of water molecules as opposed to the concentration of whatever is dissolved in the water, in this case, sugar. And so we also see this in the example of dialysis tubing, and you might have used this in lab at some point. These are just uh, tubing. It 
uh, kind of reminds me of maybe the casing on like a salami or something and they're clear and you can put some sort of concentrated solution inside of the dialysis tubing, tie it off on both ends and then uh, dip it in water and leave it soaking in water. And you'll see that the water actually goes into the dialysis tubing so that it dilutes whatever was dissolved in the solution in the dialysis tubing. So again, we're moving towards an even distribution of whatever solutes we have um, between the two different sides of the membrane. And again, we see that molecules are constantly moving. <clears throat> in what situation would diffusion and or osmosis not re result in mixing and even dis uh, distributions? So it might result in mixing, but not necessarily an even distribution um, in a case like this. If we have a selectively permeable membrane where certain molecules can move through and others cannot. So again, we're not seeing sugar on the other side of the membrane, on the left side of the membrane here, and it's going to remain that way. But we are still going to dilute um, and cause mixing on the right side uh, because the water can move through. All right. So why are we discussing this? Well, because the plasma membrane around the cell is selectively permeable. So some things can uh, diffuse through the membrane. There is also osmosis with a which occurs, water molecules move through the membrane, although they do have to kind of overcome again that energetic, energetically unfavorable point where they're within the nonpolar area of the membrane. And the cell membrane is actually very selective. So only certain molecules are going to be able to pass through. And um, these are all small molecules. With larger molecules, the cell membrane is very specific. It wants to limit what is coming into the cell, and we still need to bring things into the cell, but the cell does this through the use of very specific proteins, which can bind a substrate or a cargo that needs to be brought into the cell or out of the cell. And it's done that way rather than doing it kind of um, randomly through the membrane. <clears throat> so, um, other benefits of a semi-permeable so, or selective permeable, selectively permeable membrane. So again, I wrote selectively permeable here, but also uh, we might say semi-permeable plasma membrane. And the benefits are to keep out unwanted chemicals, keep in needed chemicals, and concentrate them. So that's a really important one for the plasma membrane, but even more so the membrane of certain organelles. Um, when uh, the cell needs to have a certain environment within an organelle or needs to keep certain enzymes in there, it's the membrane that's keeping them in there, uh, which creates specialized compartments inside of the cell. And as we're going to talk about next week, uh, membranes can be used to generate energy by controlling what is inside and outside. Again, we'll talk about that in photosynthesis and respiration. Thus far, we've been discussing the passive movement of molecules. That is the movement of molecules across a membrane or from one area to another without the use of any kind of energy, um, without even the assistance of anything. Uh, at least that's what we've talked about so far. Some types of molecules can uh, be transported using energy, as I inferred earlier, um, including large molecules, and usually it's something like a protein that will bring them across the membrane, although there are larger structures, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, I want to continue to talk about uh, passive diffusion or passive and passive osmosis for another couple minutes in this 
to, for, to end out this video. So this image right here from the textbook is a great little cheat sheet, a little summary of what types of molecules can passively move across the cell membrane. And now again, you might talk about other types of membranes in other classes or in lab, and so these um, specific categories might change a little bit. But for the cell membrane, you see that small molecules can move across if they are nonpolar. So we see oxygen, carbon dioxide, um, N2, and some steroid hormones. They can actually also cross through the membrane unassisted. Uh, some types of small uncharged but polar molecules can also cross the membrane. So again, these are molecules that do not have a charge, but they have polarity. So they have an electronegative element that holds the electrons closer to it, so it has a, a partial charge. And this includes water, ethanol, and glycerol. And we see here that some of these move across, or we have we have a small arrow and a large arrow here. What does this mean? It just means that some of these types of molecules can move across, some of them can't, and the ones that do move across, it doesn't happen as fast as the movement of the small nonpolar molecules. Then when we get to these other categories, these simply really aren't going to get across the membrane, except for in rare circumstances. So large uh, uh, uncharged polar molecules like amino acids, uh, glucose, nucleosides of both the DNA and RNA, they're not going to be able to cross membranes, the cell membrane or uh, the membranes of organelles. And it's really important that ions, so charged small molecules, are not going to be able to cross the membrane unassisted. That's crucial again for our discussion in the future of action potentials. However, all of these molecules can be moved across the membrane with assistance of different types of protein. Oftentimes, this is going to require energy in the form of ATP. Um, but sometimes uh, it won't require energy. And so we'll talk about one example right now of moving small uncharged polar molecules across the membrane, and that is actually the movement of water. So we said that, again, water can move through the membrane, not especially quickly. It's not especially common because water is polar and it can easily interact with the hydrophilic head groups on the outside and the inside of the membrane, but it can't interact with those nonpolar tail groups within the membrane between the two leaflets. So <clears throat> there is actually something called an aquaporin, and it is a protein which allows water molecules to get through the membrane. And it's really interesting because it actually allows water molecules to move one at a time. At least I think that's cool. So uh, this guy, uh, Peter Agre, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2003 for the discovery of these aquaporins. And <clears throat> this is their structure. So this is a transmembrane protein. It is in the membrane and it goes from one side all the way to the other. It is also a channel protein because it has um, a channel or a, a tunnel that goes all the way through. And it is also a barrel shaped protein. And so if you look at the ribbon structure here, we see that there are a bunch of things that look like alpha helices. They probably are alpha helices. And they are kind of, they kind of form the outside of the middle of that channel protein. So this is a really common structure for transmembrane channels. And you actually do see these domains, the alpha uh, helices, repeated in many different types of transmembrane proteins that need to transport things across. So you might come across those again, for example, maybe in a problem session. The way that the aquaporin works and the way that it is selective and 
um, I want to say it controls the amount of water that's going through so that we don't just get a rush of water coming into the cell, is that it allows water molecules to move one at a time because the channel itself is only slightly larger than a water molecule. So the channel is pretty darn small, right? Water molecules can move through. Anything larger is not going to be able to move through. In addition, other things cannot use this channel to get in and out of the cell because there are specific amino acid residues that assist the water in getting through the channel. So here we see the extracellular side and then we're inside of the channel here in the middle and then this is inside of the cell. And we see that inside of the channel, there's only one water molecule um, in, in width. So we don't see two water molecules side by side, in other words. And part of this is because the water molecules are kind of being grabbed by these different amino acid residues and then passed on to the next amino acid. So there are actually functional groups of amino acids which are interacting with these water molecules, forming hydrogen bonds. Uh, and then basically this water molecule here is forming a hydrogen bond with this, um, this residue. I'm not sure which amino acid this is actually, um, but it is forming a hydrogen bond here and it's blocking the entrance to the channel. So no other water molecules can get in. And then this uh, water molecule is interacting with this residue, the histidine, and nothing could get past it. Okay, so we've gotten that idea. The other really important part here is that, again, water likes to form hydrogen bonds. It's good at it. And so once the hydrogen bond for one of these breaks, it's going to form another hydrogen bond. So if this water molecule here breaks this hydrogen bond and moves down, then this water molecule at the top will be able to move down, form a hydrogen bond to make it a little bit more stable. And then the next water molecule can come in and form the hydrogen bond here with the first amino acid. So an analogy that I came up with for this is going through a narrow canyon or even uh, doing some kind of mountain climbing. In this particular picture here, we see that there are two spots basically where you can pause. Maybe there are some uh, stable rocks under the water here. And then there's some kind of foothold that we see back here. And imagine that these are the water molecules. The people are the water molecules. And then the foothold and the uh, stable rock to stand on are amino acid residues. So the water can kind of rest while it's forming hydrogen bonds. It's relatively stable in those spots. And then once this guy moves forward, then this person can release their footing or hydrogen bond and move to the next spot where there's stable footing. And then the next person behind this one in the white helmet can come in and take over that amino acid residue or stable foothold. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense. You, you, you can see that there are different spots, which are the amino acid residues, where the water is going to be stabilized. And it's going to jump from one to the next of these. And so again, we see that there are multiple residues within the channel itself that provide these interactions where the water can form hydrogen bonds. And that's how we get, again, the one water molecule at a time moving through and also the flow of water so that as soon as a spot that is available to form a hydrogen bond opens, then the next water molecule will go and interact with that, breaking its previous hydrogen bond, and then the new water molecule behind it will take over that 
spot that it vacated. Again, the name of this protein that allows this to happen is an aquaporin, and there's no energy expended in order for this to happen. It just depends on the structure of the protein, the width of the channel, and the amino acid residues within the protein. So again, the structure of the protein. And it is really important, again, for water management. It allows water to flow through the membrane, but it doesn't allow uh, a huge amount of water to be gained or lost at once. So I think that'll be it for this video, and we'll move on to different modes of transport in the next video.